Yeah, great. All right, so let's talk about documentation. Who loves to write documentation? Oh, there's so many. Who loves to read great documentation? Yeah, documentation is really important. Uh, so this talk is going to be about how to, how to create good, good doc documentation by making, making it more interactive. Uh, as all, all the guys doing Haskell can sort of see the title of the talk is, is a wordplay on that famous learn you a Haskell for great good. So I thought that would be appropriate for, for this. So bit background of myself. So I work this company called Umbra. We deal with 3D graphics. So we have a long, long history in 3D graphics optimization. Nowadays we are working on optimizing actual 3D models, these kind of complicated architectural models. Uh, we have offices in Finland, in, in San Francisco, and are, are of course hiring, hiring new talent. Uh, so what I'm doing there, I'm writing the back-end stuff in Scala. So our service is running, running in the Amazon cloud, where we process, process these extremely complicated 3D models, so you can actually show them on, let's say, iOS AR kit, as we saw here. But on my free time, I also work on many, many things in Scala, and one of them is Scala, Scala Fiddle. So Scala Fiddle is, is an online service where you can create share, compile, edit, run Scala code. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you can go to the scalafiddle.io address and you can just start playing with it. But it also has an embedded web component way of using it, so you can integrate these fiddles into web pages, and that's basically where this talk is going to be concentrating on. Uh, it looks like this, so it, it's sort of similar to many of the JavaScript fiddles and other, other services. You write code in there and it gets compiled and then you can run it in, in, the, serv in, in, the, in the client itself, in the browser. You can store uh, the fiddles into the system so you can load them back afterwards. You can share them, so on. You can use different libraries. You can give name and descriptions and so on. Uh, in the embedded mode, it looks a bit more simple. It just shows you the source code that you are editing and then the results of, of whatever the program actually does. And it has a link to the Scala Fiddle site, so you can continue working there as well. Uh, we actually have a, like a live, live demonstration here. We can take a quick look, so uh, how it works. So you can write, write any, any valid Scala code and then it will compile it and run it in your browser pretty quickly, actually. All right. So, how is the documentation going in the Scala ecosystem? Uh, we all know that everything could be better. If, if you consider, let's say, closure documentation, I was just this year, earlier this year in a closure conference with, where there was an excellent talk on on how to improve closure documentation, and they have these problems that they have like three websites with closure documentation, and there is not like one official documentation site, but three three different sites with dif different contents and so on. Uh, similarly, Haskell has a bit of issues with with documentation because people just are a bit too lazy in doing that. On on Scala, I think we have a pretty good situation. In, in general, that the doc documentation is yeah, actually quite, quite good. It's not as good as it could be, but it's, it's quite okay. Uh, many of the major libraries have pretty complete and even easy to read documentation, like Akka, Play, Cats, these kind of things. Uh, there is this one major exception, like Scala Z. Uh, if, if you go, go look at their website, it just says that let the types speak for themselves. Who needs documentation when you have types? So that's maybe a bit of an attitude problem. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of good tools for generating documentation, so you, don't, you can't really use that kind of excuse that it's difficult to make documentation. Many of these tools are using uh, Markdown, so you just have to learn this simple, simple uh, language for expressing documentation and then choose one of these tools to actually 
process it. The reason why documentation is so important, it's, it's essential for adoption, that if, if you are building, let's say, a new library and you want people to use it, then the documentation is, is the best way to convey uh, the ideas and, and what, what you actually did the library for, that people actually understand that wh why should I use a library and how should I use it, what, what are the things that your library can, can do for me. And quite often people focus on the library itself, that the code base is really great and it works well, there's a lot of maybe tests and so on, but they, they sort of skip in the documentation because it's a lot when you write the library, it's sort of hard to understand that if somebody has never heard of it, what, what are the problems that they are facing? Because I, I know the library very well. I, I wrote it myself. So well, how, how can I even understand that? What, 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 what are the problems that these sort of new, newcomers are, are facing there? Uh, so how, how to improve the docs? Uh, one, one clear thing, what, what I like to see is examples that I don't care to read long pieces of text sort of explaining things. I want to see examples, lots of examples, because that's, at least for me, is, is a sort of clear way of understanding the library. That how do you use the library? What are the different options that there are? And so on. So examples are, are a really good way of, of doing that. But the problem with examples is that they are typically too simple, because you have, you have to sort of balance these things, that if, if you put two complicated examples, then they are too difficult. So you have to start with the hello world kind of stuff, and then you move on from there, but then you end up having lots of lots of different examples, sort of building, building from one, one example to the other. So if you, for example, take a look at the Scala, Scala language documentation, it has a lot of, lot of these like super simple examples just explaining like one one concept at a time and that works well for like explaining a language but when you are dealing with the library it becomes pretty tedious to go from like explaining every method or every function this way so a better way is to make those examples interactive so that instead of you deciding as, as the writer of documentation and what what should what should the reader see there let them do it themselves. Just give them like a playground and some, some examples to start with, but then they can continue on their own. And this enables learning through exploration. So that instead of just sort of passively reading examples that somebody else has written, you can actually start exploring the library, exploring the language yourself. And this is a very powerful way of, of learning, learning these things. And it's also, it means that you, as a, as a library developer, you don't have to write all those examples yourself. You can just give good, good examples as starting points for people to start their own exploration. So, how to use ColorFiddle for these examples? There are a couple of, couple of options how you can do that. One, the most simple one is that you go to the scalafiddle.io, you write the examples there, you store them there, you get this ID, and then you can just give a link to that, that uh, specific fiddle. Uh, this has been used in a couple of libraries at least. There is uh, this binding.scala, which is a UI library for Scala.js. They have on, on their GitHub, they have this maybe a dozen, dozen links to different examples on how to how to use binding.scala in, in directly in, in Scala Fiddle. Uh, a more advanced way would be to add an iframe, which actually loads the embedded Scala Fiddle, so you would still have them on the scalafiddle.io site, but they would be embedded into the documentation within the iframe. But this is all uh, pretty sort of well, it's, it's, it's not difficult, but it takes time, because you have to maintain your documentation not only in your own repo, but you would maintain the examples in scalafiddle.io uh, site. So what we've come up just, just recently is, is this kind of a new, new way of integrating documentation by just flagging pieces of code in your HTML and then using this integration.js script, which is served by the Scala Fiddle server. We'll go into the example shortly. 
and even even easier for a couple of documentation generation tools there is already plugins that make it even easier so you can just directly in, in markdown uh, flag these code examples that okay this I want this example to be be an interactive fiddle so the integration.js is, is a very small script that it just looks into the HTML and replaces those code blocks with fiddles. The way it works is just you just define this kind of a div tag with a specific data at attribute. So you just surround the existing code with this, and then you load load the integration JS, which will actually then create this kind of a button there that will uh, let let the user then run this specific example. And the way it does it is basically it just replaces this existing block of block of text with an embedded fiddle when you click click that button. So let's see how that works in real life. So I'm actually going to do it in, in this real real documentation page. So this is Scala Scala documentation, and I'm going to inject it into the actual. HTML. So I'm just going to select this code code block and edit edit the HTML and add the magic keyword there, Scala fiddle, and close close the tag. So nothing nothing happens at this point because I haven't loaded the script yet. But then I'm going to manually manually load the script from the locally running Scala fiddle server. And that will then insert the button there. So you could basically do do this for all of these examples. So you could have like hundred examples on a page, and each one of them would get their own own run button. And when I click click the button, I get this fiddle. It's like I said, the Scala fiddle server is running on my computer here, so I'm not relying on on the network connectivity as it often breaks down exactly when you need it. Uh, and now you can just go and do changes, and you can start exploring that, what, what will happen if, if I change these things. And as you can see, it's, it's pretty responsive. It goes, goes to the server, compiles the Scala code into JavaScript, loads the JavaScript into your browser, and runs it in the browser, and it works pretty, pretty fast. And if you make some, some errors, you also get, get these error messages directly here. And you can see that okay, what what's what's the problem and what should I do do about it and fix it? All right, so that's that's pretty easy. Uh, so this this works basically on on any any documentation style that wh whatever tools you are using, you can always just insert these divs and then load the script, and it will just take. Take the source code between those div, div, or within that div tag, and then it will create the fiddle fiddle out of that. Uh, it doesn't matter if you have like highlighting or things like that. It's just looking at the textual context. So basically, if if you are like copy pasting the text, it does exactly exactly the same thing. So it's quite quite trivial to integrate. Uh, you can also customize this this fiddle, you have these kind of content parameters. So instead of just having that piece of code there, you can also define library de dependencies. Uh, you can add some prefix code there, for example, some import statements. So you don't need to show them in the code block to the user, but the import statements still exist there. Uh, you can use templates. This is a bit more complicated. Uh, you can specify, for example, the Scala version. Is it 2.11, 2.12, so on. So all kinds of things that you can sort of customize the uh, fiddle for that particular purpose. And there are some visual parameters for changing layout theme, changing the height, and so on. For example, this is this is the typical typical layout. It's split in a ver vertical direction into two pieces. But in some cases, you might want to have this kind of horizontal layout where they are side by side, depending on, on the use case. But for example, on mobile, this version works much better 
because you usually have a very narrow screen. But on desktop, you have a lot of space, so this, this could be useful. And if, if you like to have a dark, dark team, if you, if you have a blog or something that's using uh, dark, dark uh, color uh, coding for, for your code, then you can also sort of synchronize Scala Fiddle to use the dark team as well. Uh, but to make, make things easier, uh, I've created a couple of plugins for the most commonly used documentation generation tool. So Jekyll is, is what's powering, for example, SBT microsites and a lot of other, other tools. Gitbook is also quite popular. It's done in JavaScript. So I had to spend time writing both Ruby for Jekyll and JavaScript for Gitbook. And whoa, that was a horrible experience again. Uh, not, I mean, the documentation of these tools is, is pretty bad. Uh, so you have to just print off, debug everything. So what they do is you basically have existing markdown in your documentation. And all you have to do is just insert these tags around your code. And that's, that's it. Everything else happens automatically. Uh, the same parameters are, are used as with integration JS, because these are, of course, generating that div with the parameters for integration JS. And, and you can also define templates easily using, using these plugins. And as, as I said, for example, Microsites is using Jekyll underneath. So this works directly in there. And let's see how it actually works. So, so this is a documentation for this JSON library called Circe or Kirki, as it might be pronounced. There are actually a couple of, couple of options there. So they have a small, small example there that, OK, well, well, what can you do with Circe on, on serialization of, of case classes and stuff like that into JSON and back? So if, if we look, look at the markdown code, it's, it's right here, just normal, normal Scala thing. And what we are going to do, do now is just going to add the magic markers here. Oops. And also the other, other thing we need to do is because this, this, this example was originally meant for like REPL where every line is evaluated and you can see the results. But with Scala Fiddle, you have to explicitly print out the results that you want to see. So let's add some print ln functions here, method calls to make sure things work. And we can also take a quick peek on on the build SBT. So in the build SBT, I'm, I'm defining some parameters for the plugin. Uh, first of all, there is the URL because I want to override it to use the local, local instance of Scala Fiddle that I have. And then there are these dependencies. So three, three different dependencies that these examples actually require. So this is, this is how you, it's a similar syntax that you would use in SBT otherwise. So you just define that, okay, I'm, I'm going to need these these libraries for, for the examples that I'm using. So this way you don't have to define the dependencies for every Scala Fiddle tag that you are using in your documentation, but this is like a shared, uh, shared definition for those. Okay, now I have updated the code, and then I'm going to rebuild the microsite. This is small text, but you don't, you don't need to worry about what's going on there. It's a bit slow. Slow process takes about 10 seconds to build. build the site again. Hopefully it takes only 10 seconds, sometimes it takes more. Oh, 21 seconds, great. Okay, now I got the run button there. Let's see what happens. Did I get everything correctly? So now it's compiling, and because these examples are using actually shapeless, so the compilation takes, takes a lot longer, but you can see you get the results eventually. 
so now let's let's do some exploration. So now I now I can see that if if I have this uh, option type here, it will encode it directly as as 14. Uh, what, what if I actually put none? Because I'm I'm interested in seeing that how how does it encode none in the JSON? Okay, it uses null. Uh, what if I add another type here, like either? Either is always interesting. Uh, how does it encode that? Uh, let's put a left error here, and let's see what happens. Okay, so Cersei is, is using this kind of a technique for encoding either. Now, if, if I didn't have this kind of interactive mode of exploring Cersei, uh, I would have to go into the documentation. Documentation probably wouldn't say anything about this. I would either have to build a local project and try these things out myself, or go to scalafiddle.io to do these things. But here, it's, it's like really, really easy that you just go to the library documentation site, you look at the examples, you modify the examples, you try out things that are relevant to you, and you get this, this kind of feedback immediately. Okay. So far, so good. So let's, let's look at an, another example, which is another library another serialization library called Boopicle. Uh, and it's, unlike Cersei, it doesn't serialize into JSON, but it serializes into, uh, into binary format. Uh, so here is a sort of a simple example, again, serializing some kind of a data type. And if we look at the actual code, it looks pretty similar as in, as in Cersei. You have this piece of piece of Scala code within your markdown that you need to need to use. Uh, so Cersei is built with microsite uh, SBT microsite, so it's using Jekyll plugin. Uh, here we are actually uh, using uh, Gitbook, which is another other plugin. So I'll, I'll just briefly go back to Cersei and show you how it's how it's defined. So the only, only thing you have to do is basically to add, add into the plugins directory this Jekyll Scala Fiddle.rb file, and that's, that's it. Then the plugin is there in place, and you can, you can get things, things going. Uh, it's a bit same same thing for, for Gitbook. You have to uh, define define the Scala Fiddle plugin in the Gitbook JSON, and then there is again the same same kind of configuration as as in the other other one. You can define these dependencies, and again, I'm overriding the URL for the local host. But this is normally you wouldn't need to do this. You can just use the service online. But for example, if if you are for uh, like dealing with a version of your library that's not public yet, that you have a snapshot, then you really, what you need to do is you need to run, uh, run Scala Fiddle locally and to insert the snapshot library there, so you can test, test these things, but in, in normal cases, you don't need to do that. All right, so let's go and add, add the same, same stuff here. But now what I, what I actually want to do is that I, I notice that I don't have the imports here, so I want to add, add a prefix, so I don't need to put, put that import into the uh, code block itself, but I'm just going to import all, all the things that are necessary for this thing to work, and let's, let's add again some print. Print statements here just to show what's what's going on there. And now I need to run the build the book again. There we go. And hopefully it's there. Okay. Everything is working so smoothly. Surprisingly, surprisingly, it's always risky to do these kind of 
live demonstrations of things that you have sort of completed, fixing last bugs yesterday and things like that. But so far, so good. So let's run it. Again, it's compiling things, and you can you can see the see the results. Uh, so the result uh, for the byte buffer is not not that interesting because it's it doesn't show you anything what's what's inside inside the buffer. It just says that okay, it has 41 bytes, and the capacity is half half a kilo. So that's that's not very interesting. So one thing we can do is is we can use we can extend, we can define like a show type class for, for this stuff so that we can actually show the content of, of, of a byte buffer. And, and to do that, we are going to define, define a template. So templates are basically just pieces of code that go around this uh, fiddle. Uh, so you can define stuff there that's included before your fiddle and stuff that goes after your fiddle. Uh, let me let me put the template in here. Show and uh, the show template is actually defined in in the documentation folder. It's under templates. So this is this is the show. So this is just a piece of piece of. Uh, Scala, co Scala code that you can you write yourself. So this is just something that's sort of copy pasted before your actual actual example. So this is this is a place where you can put sort of common things that you use in your examples, but you don't want to show to the user because they are not not really interested in in these kind of things. So I'm just going to define like a very simple simple show type class here that converts any anything to HTML. And then I have this kind of a nice, nice way of printing the hexadecimal content of, of the byte buffer. And then I just define an instance of, of that type class and define a method to call, call that stuff. But this is, this is, of course, familiar to all of, all of you, so not, not that interesting to go into it, into it except maybe for, for this kind of HTML generation. Because the fact is that ScalaFiddle is running in the browser, so you are not limited to outputting just text, but you can output any kind of HTML. You have full, full control of, of, of the DOM and full control of canvases, and you can draw things, and you can do interactive things. You can create, you can create buttons, you can create uh, text fields, you can create like truly interactive fiddles that are not just interactive in the way that you can edit the code, but also that the code generates something that's interactive like it's let's say that you were working on a parsing library and you wouldn't you would want to show an example that okay just write input here and i will parse it and show you the example and that's something you can do directly in in scala fiddle that you can just generate those html components to to do those things here i'm just doing a sort of a pre pre tag with some style definition to make it sort of pop out from from the usual usual things so let's go and add, or actually replace this println with, with show. And compile again. Let's reload. Let's see what happens. Would be nice to browse. Okay, so now we got this nice, nice little representation of of the content of the byte buffer as a, as a sort of hex hex dump style that you can you can see the hexadecimal values and and the characters. So now if I go and actually change these floating point values to something else and run it again, I can see that things things are changing in 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 there. And as you as you can see, it's pretty pretty rapid. Uh, interaction. So those are sort of uh, sort of sim simple things you can do there. Like I said, you can really really go all the way. You can build like an interactive application in the fiddle if you want, and because it's just JavaScript running in the user's browser, you can do anything there that that the user user allows you to do. You are not not limited into what what you can do on the server side. 
All right, let's go back to the slides. So it's important for, for Scala Fiddle to perform well, because if, if you have this kind of interactive documentation, you want it to be interactive in the sense that users don't need to wait for things to happen. Uh, for example, if you are using Scusti, another kind of uh, online playground for Scala, it's, it's a lot slower because it needs to load the full SBT context and then that can take like 20 seconds to load. And after that it gets faster, but it's still, still not quite, quite as fast as, as Scala Fiddle. And this is really important because people have a sort of understanding that, well, Scala is, is slow. It's, I mean, the compilation is slow, but it's not the, really the Scala compiler that's slow. It's usually SBT that's slow. For example, I've been looking at uh, the statistics generated by scalafiddle.io that typically the user experience for, for a compilation is, is definitely less than 400 milliseconds. So you're doing some edits, you compile, and you get the result in less than a half second. And on the server side, the actual compilation time is typically between 150 and 200 milliseconds. So that's, that's the time it takes for the code to compile into JavaScript, and then that gets back, sent back, back to the client. So this is definitely something that you can really use for interactive, interactive things. So what, what makes Scala Fiddle uh, fast? I, I recently wrote a Medium blog post about this on, on going more into the details, but basically it's all about caching, caching, caching on different levels. So the first, first level uh, after the client does something is, is I'm using Cloudflare uh, Content Delivery Network. So quite often the case is, especially when it comes to like embedded documentation fiddles is that somebody has seen that before. Somebody has compiled that exact same thing before. So why should we compile it again? Because it's, it's going to end up being exactly the same. So the way the Scalafill client works is that it actually computes a hash of the source code and then it asks with only that hash that, okay, do you have a result for this? And if, if you have, then fine, it takes like 20 milliseconds to compile even a complicated piece of, piece of code. And, and the server doesn't even see the request because the Cloudflare, uh, the CDN, uh, sort of handles that. But if, if you get a 404, it doesn't exist, then it basically posts the, the source code to the server, and then it goes to the compiler and so on. And on the compiler side, so there are like two levels of caching. One, one is on, on the CDN, which, and the CDN network also has that benefit that internet itself is not very fair. That if you connect, let's say, from China to the server in Germany, it's, it's not that fast. But when you are using these uh, CDNs, they have their own networks and they have edge locations everywhere. They have edge locations in Japan, China, Australia. So the distance isn't so bad anymore because all the network communication goes through, through their internal network, which is faster than the general internet. So that's, that's one level of caching. Then the router is, is an application running, running on the Scalafiddle server that also contains a cache. Everything has, that has ever been compiled on Scalafiddle is cached there because it's, it's it's just data, it's, it's not that big. So if, if, if it encounters the same data, then you will just get, get the result back directly. No, no compilation happens. But when you actually start experimenting and uh, exploring and doing, thing, doing changes, then you will eventually do something that ha nobody else, else has done before, and it will invoke one of these compiler instances. Uh, so currently, this is, this is a setup uh, in scalafiddle.io. So there are four, four compiler instances for 2.12 and two for 2.11, because previously only 2.11 was supported. So those two are still there to sort of support the legacy, legacy stuff. And, and the way these compilers work is that they also do a lot of caching. So instead of sort of creating a new compiler, it's reusing the compiler. So when you have a, a limited set of libraries, it sort of selects that, okay, hey, that compiler A has cached these libraries. So they have, there's a compiler ready there that has all this stuff already in place. And this is especially important for the Scala.js part, which can then 
use incremental linking and incremental compilation because then all, all the library code has been seen already and when you just do modifications in your own little one Scala file then nothing else uh, needs to be recompiled and it's, it becomes really really quite fast and this router is basically choosing which compiler to use so it knows that okay that compiler was using these libraries before that one wasn't so it, it just chooses the correct correct compiler uh, to enable fast fast compilation and then within the compiler because Scalafiddle is sort of limited into a set of libraries it knows beforehand all the libraries there are uh, it actually builds this kind of fast cache this one one single file it's about one 1.4 gigabytes at the moment that contains all the class files all the Scala JS intermediate representation files in this one one big file and then this file is basically memory mapped into each, each compiler instance so they have very quick access to all the library library code so there's no need to open jar files or browse browse through the jar files and extract classes and things like that so that that makes that process extremely fast so in the end uh, the Scala fiddle is, is really fast it's faster than running code locally in SBT and that's that's pretty good including the network latency you get from from calling calling the server in Germany so it's it's pretty uh, and and it's also very scalable in the sense that this caching takes care of all all the sort of heavy lifting that if you have very popular documentation and people are really running those fiddles it doesn't matter because most of that stuff comes directly from the cache only a few people here and there are actually going to be editing the code and so on and so this this scales very really well all right next steps for for this thing uh, the plan is to add more plugins for other documentation generators that are being used in, in Scala. There are Paradox from, from Lightbend, Scala Text, other, other tools are there. The mo most of these are working in the markdown space, so it's pretty same stuff as, as done before, but they might have some different implementation languages and so on. And, and to get people and libraries and, and developers to actually use it, my plan is to sort of make PRs to existing library documentation that instead of asking, hey, could you start using this? I'm just going to do a PR that, okay, this integrates Scala Fiddle into your examples, please ex accept it, and then magically your, your stuff is now interactive and people are really, really happy about it. Then a bit other, other kind of functionality planning, planning to add there is to do this kind of correctness verification of the documentation examples at build time. So this is something that there is a, like this TUT plugin for uh, SB, SBT that already does this kind of thing that it compiles, compiles the examples locally and then verifies that they actually compile and it also produces the REPL responses and so on but that's, that's actually quite slow. So this would be much faster because again, with the caching, whenever the hash ends up being the same, it's like immediate response that, okay, this, this, this is okay. Nothing, nothing to worry about it. And this, this would make it a lot easier to sort of trust your documentation that when you make updates to your library, you can just have the Scala Fiddle service to sort of verify that your examples are still compiling. Right now you just need to go and test them individually in the browser and make sure everything compiles. But this should be quite trivial to add. And surprisingly, a lot of people are using these things on, on mobile, uh, even, even the current Scala Fiddle, which is not super, super friendly for mobile user experience. But this is, this is again, a good, good use case for uh, improving the documentation, that your documentation really works. Works on mobile and people can explore these things on the mobile. So in, in summary, it's ready, go use it. So there's one caveat, I've been talking about how, how, how important great documentation is, but there is no documentation on, on, this, on this integration thing. So, but, the, but the code is there, so you can look at the Ruby code and the JavaScript code. But anyway, it, it should be a, 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 up there in, in a few days. Uh, and and it, I'm going to be publishing the Jekyll plugin 
in, in, in the repo for Ruby stuff and the same thing for the Gitbook, Gitbook plugin for NPM so you can very, very easily install them locally and start, start using stuff. And then make documentation great again. All right, thank you, that's all I have. Any questions? Uh, can you elaborate on the hardware specs of the machines running, the, the compiler and editing? Sure, I can. Whoops, let's not get too big. So that's, that's the hardware spec of, of the server <laughs> running running fiddle so it's just a single single server with four cores bit of bit of memory a lot of lot of disks costs about 30 euros a month so not not a big but not a big deal so you don't need to have like super high end servers to run this thing and of course scala fiddle is is it's published it's open source of course but it's also published as docker images so it's very very easy to set up your own scala fiddle like if you want to have a in, inside a company or inside an enterprise, something like a private Scala fiddle where you can use your private libraries and share privately code, you can just easily set it up. There are even the setup for scalafiddle.io itself is in, in the repo, so you can just take that and start modifying the parameters. So, thank you for your presentation and for the tool. And my question is regarding security. So, how you approach uh, the security? So basically compiling code on your servers and then running uh, the code in the browser so you can compile some tricky stuff. Yeah, yeah. so the sec security aspect is actually quite important and one of the things that Scala Fiddle sort of solves uh, is that because it's using Scala JS, then it never runs the code on the server. For example, if you are using Scasti or many of the other sort of fiddles for other languages, they are running the code on the server. And then on the server, you have to be really careful that what, what, can, what can people do there. Uh, in Scala Fiddle, we don't have that problem at all because all the code is running in your browser. And basically, you as a user are causing things to happen. And then it's running in your browser. And, it's, and, then, in, and then it's sort of your fault if, if, <laughs> if you do something, something wrong. So the one thing that would allow you to run code on, on the server is to use is to implement macros. But because Scala, <laughs> Scala Fiddle allows you to only have one compilation unit, this one code base, you cannot define a macro and use it in the same, same compilation unit. So even that aspect is sort of blocked automatically. Thank you. Anything else? Thanks for the, for the great presentation. Um, what would it take to completely move to the client? So going around the security issues by compiling in the browser. Well, basically, the Scala compiler itself would need to run in the, in the browser. So maybe, maybe Dari or something would be sort of compatible enough that it could run using Scala.js. Have you tried compiling Dottie with Scala.js? No, and I have no interest in, in trying that, but... Okay, that's it. And one more. Uh, hi. Uh, do you plan on allowing to add libraries to fiddles on demand, like those not available by default? Yeah, so the, so the libraries are basically defined in, in a JSON file in, in, the, in the repo, and you can just do PRs to add libraries in there. Uh, but it cannot... Uh, or at, at least currently, I don't have plan to let let people use any any library because then there are, for example, you could publish a library with all kind of malicious code, which would then end up being run on on the server because you could do macros and stuff like that there. So I want to be there is a bit of a like gatekeeping there that only only libraries that are sort of seem okay are allowed in there into the. Scalafiddle.io site. 
Of course, you can anybody can set up their own Scala Fiddle dot Scala Fiddle service with whatever libraries they want, and that's just fine. Uh, so it's it's just the restriction of of, of the Scala Fiddle dot io site itself. Okay, thanks. Okay. Sorry, small questions. Um, what will happen if Scala Fiddle is not available for some reason? How it will handle such a situation? Yeah, it's it's actually surprisingly solid. Uh, it ha it hasn't really gone down at all. Almost there's there are some hiccups from now and then. So uh, so one one thing is that if you have documentation that depends on Scala Fiddle, uh, but if it cannot load the integration JS because that's loaded from the same location, then nothing happens. You don't see those run buttons. The documentation basically stays as static documentation until Scala Fiddle is available again. But if, if something else goes wrong, then usually the compilations fail. But even then, the caching sort of ensures you that some of the results are available even if, if the whole thing is down. But yeah, that's, that's definitely something. Because right, right now, I'm sort of taking care of that server. And I'm, I'm not like looking at it 24-7. So there are cases where things, things go wrong. So I'm actually looking for some maybe some, some other, other company to take care of that sort of main maintenance of, of scalafiddle.io at, at some point. All right, anything else? Seems no. Okay, let's, send, let's say thank you once again.